Now, we know what gamma is, we don't know what alpha is, and now we get into the meat of the presentation, which is beta, or beta. What is beta? Just what is beta? Well, alpha is diversity in an habitat, as measured from one sample, or one, or one sample set, right? But, quite often, when we take a number of samples along a gradient, and this is one of the many <coughs> interpretations of beta, Okay. Beta has a lot of interpretations and at least 10 or 12 different ways to look at and some of them have almost nothing in common. So beta can, can mean a lot of things. In one of the papers I put you in the, in the key is uh, a set of very interesting papers, highly mathematical but very interesting, by Tumisto explaining. Over three years she made a, a compilation of all the literature about beta. It was enormous, and enormous in the differences too. But well, one of the interpretations of beta is that since you are, basically the field is a continuum, if you sample along that continuum, along a gradient, say an environmental gradient for instance, you will get a number, a, a slow overlap of a species. Species don't normally disappear in an abrupt manner they will substitute each other, more or less gradually. So beta is a way to look at diversity when you have samples along this gradient, and then there is a turnover of species from one habitat to the next habitat. But this is, I insist, only one way to look at beta diversity. It could be simply the amount of vari variability between samples. You have one sample, you have another sample, and you have some differences. This difference could be beta too. <coughs> Tuomisto gave this definition of beta as classes from the partitioning, again, from the partitioning point of view. Okay, how many subunits would, be, would there be if total species diversity of the data set and the mean, the average, Species diversity per subunit. Remember what we did? Total diversity, gamma, alpha diversity. Okay. What, how many units, how many samples would we need <coughs> to get exactly the same diversity? Yeah. But there were no shared species between samples. In our previous sample, many species were shared among columns. A species would appear in several samples. So it gave one average diversity, one gamma diversity. Suppose we get the same alpha and gamma diversity, but in a set of samples in which no species is in common. The number of samples would be beta diversity. So it's an operational definition. By subunit, she means each habitat or each sample. A species diversity per subunit is alpha diversity. Species diversity of the data set is what, what I called before gamma diversity. So this is what it's also called the true beta. The true beta, which is a fractional component then of total diversity. Gamma would be alpha times beta. But there is an alternate way too. We can measure beta as a turnover. And then it's an additive component of diversity. The previous component was a multiplicative component, alpha times beta. But it could, could also be an additive component. Beta is diversity across sites. We already say that. But one operational and very simple measure is species turnover. We look at how species replace each other. It comes naturally when you are looking at diversity across a gradient. But it's an additive component. Gamma would be then alpha plus beta. Let's go in a little bit more, more detail here. A species is distributed along a gradient according to some kind of response function. It could be anything. It could be fitness or it could be, in our case, what interests us is it could be numbers, abundance. So this is the ideal state for the species. Uh, towns uh, 
silverback gorilla in the example before has an ideal habitat up there in the mountains in the misty mountains with lots of fog lots of rain lots of fruit and no humans if possible that's the optimal position it doesn't go below that because it's too warm such a big thing has to dissipate a lot of heat and and in humid conditions it's really hard to get rid of heat of, 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 of heat it doesn't go up uh, much upper because probably there will be less fruit so it has a niche along that gradient so different species will have different gradients along that niche all right and you can sample here and you can sample here and get a different set of species or if you have you have you sample here and you sample here you get very similar species because the ranges will overlap now what is beta in these terms suppose you have this environmental gradient and these are the curves of the fitness of the species this would be basically a low beta environment because as you move from one gradient along the gradient the change in the species is small here at this point you have red species purple species green species uh, whatever color species orange color species and blue species and if you move here basically only the green one has disappeared although the abundances are different however this other example here is a high beta uh, um, environment when you move from this place in your environmental gradient to this place in your environmental gradient the composition has changed more dramatically species are not shared so much right so a gradient lends itself to this particular definition of beta how is species changed over time <coughs> how do we measure it well there are several turnover based beta metrics if we define i as the number of samples that you have inventories and you define alpha alpha t as the average alpha diversity as we saw before eh? and gamma as the gamma diversity then we have the absolute species turnover which is uh, basically how much diversity exceeds in the entire data set, data set that of the average sample in other in other words what is the difference between alpha diversity and gamma diversity remember additive alpha diversity plus beta diversity then gamma diversity the difference from alpha average alpha to gamma and that's the species turnover absolute species turnover uh, we talk here did a, uh, a slightly more uh, slightly different definition which is the number of complete complete inventory replacement between samples in this formula here so it's basically the quotient between gamma and alpha so he didn't make it addit additive basically it's a standardization it's a turnover rate how many times your species have been changed by other species and there's also a proportional species turnover what fraction of the diversity of the data set is missing from the average sample I have an average sample and I'm missing a lot of diversity how much am I missing that's the proportion species turnover well enough about beta now let's go into a different concept ecological distance you are already familiar with uh, environmental distance because yesterday Town and Kate and Lindy were working heavily with you in, in putting together this this very shred contraption to look at distances in the in the envi environmental space so <coughs> remember environmental distance is how far you are uh, how, far, how far you have one sample from another sample if you plot the sample in a space which is defined by env environmental factors ecological distance is slightly different ecological distance is essentially the distance across various ecological gradients that define ecological communities that's some obscure, obscure definition but we can simplify it a little bit we can measure the ecological distance between two sites or two species based on what 
Basically, the ecological distance between two sites is looking at how many species they share. Because if they share species, they also share ecological characteristics. <coughs> if, ha if I have a given set of species in habitat A, and the same set of species in habitat B, what is the ecological distance? Large or, sm or small? It's small, because basically, if they share the same species, they are, sharing the si they are sharing the same environmental or the same ecological characteristics. So it's highly related to environmental distance, but it's not the same thing. <coughs> this relates, obviously, to beta diversity. But beta is measured for the entire gradient, and ecological distance is something that you take, you measure between two given samples. Sample A, sample B. However, environmental distance, or sorry, ecological distance can be very large if you have a lot of noise in your data. And in biology, you have noise all over. The signal to noise ratio, when we try to look at the signal in ecology, tends to be extremely low. Palmer has given a very comprehensive account of ecological distance, if you want to, to look at that, but I, now that I think of it, I forgot to put that paper on the keyboard. Anyway, it's quite easy to find. Okay, what is similar, what is distant, in terms of ecological distance? If two inventories contain the same set of species, then they are identical. If two inventories share a lot of species, they are similar. If two inventories share very little or nothing, they are distant in ecological space. Hmm? So the less shared species, the more different ecological space. How could we then measure, measure distance in ecological space? Look at the shared species. Few shared species, lots of distance. But look, species can actually be shared and still ecological distance be large because sharing a species is not the only requirement. Species have different abundances. You might have the same set of species in two habitats, but which species is abundant or dominant in one habitat but might be completely different from which species is abundant or dominant in the second habitat. And you have to take this into account. So their numbers, the population size, has to be taken into account too, to measure that distance. So two components, species overlap and abundance equivalence into the ecological distance. To look at that, we, can, you could, we could use indices. We could use qualitative or quantitative indices. The qualitative indices are also called binary indexes. Uh, binary measure is only looking at whether the species are shared or not. Only the first component. Remember two components. Shared species, similar distributions. Any binary indice, in, index will only look at occurrences and will not take into account how many occurrences you have. It's whether a species is there or not. That's it. That's simple and, very, and often very convenient because you can't have abundance data or frequency data. For frequency data, you have to sample a lot. And take a, a, number, a, a large number of squares and see how many squares as particular species exists. Quantitative indexes take abundance or frequencies into account. So they are more precise, but also, also more subject to which, to which annoyance that we have in ecology, and I just spoke about that, that annoyance, noise. Abundance, abundance is affected by noise. Whereas occurrences, presence, binary data are much less abundant, uh, affected by noise. Hmm? You have a lot of noise, you're better off with a binary index. You have little noise, little perturbations or uncertainties in your sampling, okay, try to go to a quantitative index if you can. It has a lot of requirements. Let me play with one of my favorite uh, lecturing data sets, which is one that I use a lot with my students, which was given to me by Hunt, uh, an ornithologist, so we are going to birds again. <laughs> and this is the most, the absolutely famous uh, 
data set on Arctic birds. Hmm? And uh, you will forgive me, Town, if I got all those names wrong because I had the Spanish names and I didn't, I didn't know the, the English names, but I guess they are more or less correct. Nothing terrifying. Nothing what? Nothing makes sense? Nothing terrifying. Ah, okay. <laughs> all right. So the data set is this. We have Arctic birds, which are very nice to look at, um, but you shouldn't <laughs> approach them too much because some of them have terribly beaks. And uh, a number of sites, this is just a small part of the data set, a number of sites in the Arctic. Okay? And those numbers are the estimate population numbers, the estimate colony numbers on those sites. Mm. This is just a, a code, a simplified code to, to easy things in the analysis. All right? So you see that this data set has a lot of zeros. A lot of species which are rare enough only to appear in a few places. So since for, for instance, this tufted puffin will only appear in these two samples and will be absent from other places. And also it shows a lot of dominance. The thick build thick build more or mar or whatever you pronounce it. Mur. Mur, thank you. That's what they do, they say. That's interesting. OK. <laughs> bueno, halka para nosotros. <laughs> this is one is extremely abundant, abundant, however, in basically all the colonies except Norton Sound in the Bering Sea, where it, is, it has been completely displaced by a different mural, which is the common mural. <laughs> OK, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, uh, these uh, stations or these islands are in the high Arctic, mostly, most of them. This is uh, Cape Lisbon, this is Cape Thompson, Northern Sound. Uh, those are the Pibilof Islands, uh, St. Paul, St. George. This is the Bering Sea and in the Pacific and in the Atlantic between uh, Denmark, uh, well, Denmark, sorry, Greenland, which, well, technically is Denmark. <laughs> and. Uh, in Canada, we have Cape Hay, uh, um, Prince, uh, Prince Leopold Island, etc. And we have a farther south island here in the, isle, in the Irish Sea, which is Scomer Island. So you see, basically everything is around the 70 or 80 <coughs> parallel, except this one, this uh, couple of, of samples here, which are in the 50 parallel. So but they are much southern. All right? Now, how many of you are. <coughs> oh, oh. I'm at the end of the rope. How many of you uh, are familiar with Jacquard Index? Sorensen, Rogers, Jules, Tanimoto. All those are binary indexes. Has any of you never used uh, a binary index? So I don't need to go through how a, a binary index works. Or you, or you prefer it to see? Yeah. A very quick and simple procedure for a binary index. <coughs> we take two of those samples, all right? Two of them. I call it sample G and sample K. I don't know which one. This could be the Privilov and this could be the RHC. It doesn't matter. And the species that are there. So a species can belong to one of those situations. Those species, you see, are present at both sides. They are present at site J and are present at site K. At site K. So this is what we call A, common species. Hmm? Those four species are common or shared species. However, there are species which are exclusive of one sample. For instance, you see this muir, the oaklet, and the kittiwake here only appear on sample G, so they are right here. They are what we call B. Okay? And analogously, there are a number of species which only appear in K, and they will be called C species. A species, shared species, B species, exclusive of, of sample A, G in this case, C species, exclusive of sample, sample K. With this, we can calculate a very simple index which looks at how many species are shared 
as respect to the total number of species in these two in these two samples and this is the called the, the jacar index that you know perfectly well commonalities or shared species divided by total number of species uh, well this total number of species in this case would render 0.31 jacar however if you look at this you see here how many species 4, 5, 9, uh, 14, right? But you have more species here. 14 are the species that can appear in G, in K, or in both. But you have more here. You have the Atlantic puffin here, the Russell whale, the black guillemot, and the herringal. What's up with them? They are in the data set. They simply don't appear in this particular set of two. And those are called the double absent and they are represented by T. Species, when you are comparing two given samples from an entire data set that are missing species that actually appear somewhere else in the data set. So you can look at the similarities and you can look at differences. And basically the binary indexes are different in, the, in how much importance they give to commonalities or differences. Jacquard pays no attention to the, this double absence. However, other indexes might. Yeah. For instance, yeah, this is a selection of, of indexes yeah, in which some of them will have D, and some, such as Sokal and Sneath, and, or, or simple matching, and some of them don't have any. Okay, so if we run past over the data set of births, you get this result here, which is the, the similarity index, which can be transformed in a distance indexes, index by taking the complementary. And you can see, looking at the table, that some of the indexes are very large, and some of the indexes, of the indexes are very small, but basically most things are really, really, really low. You don't care about the di diagonal because it's comparing one sample with itself, so it doesn't make any sense. But if you look, for instance, at Pial, Prince Leopold Island, and CI, which are very close together, they have a high similarity. Hmm? <coughs> now, normally you visualize this, as you know, using a cluster. <coughs> there are a number of clustering techniques, but the result could be something like this, in which St. Paul and St. George basically have identical composition, that's because they are the pivot of islands, which are next to each other. Whereas you have a lot of differences when you take into account this Comer Island, which is so far away that basically is different from anything else. Right? This is what we normally do almost every day. So we have the distance coefficient, we take into account the abundance data. And I finish very soon. They are very highly intuitive because they measure the similarity in a way that, such as if the distance is zero, the inventories are identical. Many indices have been developed, and also we now have a general dissimilarity model, or GDM, uh, which is rather complicated, rather complex, and I won't get into the details of the mathematical details of it, but you also have the module for R in the, in the key that, in the pen drive that I circulated there. What is the basic principle of the quantitative quantitative indexes? Well, basically, it's a distance in mathematical space. Let's take the simplest possible case. Let's take two inventories with two species. So it's a very, very small data set. We only have two species, we only have two samples. That's all, nothing else. But we have numbers. So species A in sample A in sample A has 35 individuals, and species A is represented by 70 individuals in the other sample, sample B. And so species B has 40 individuals in sample A and 10 individuals in sample B. It can go much it can go any simpler than that. We could have more species or more samples, but let's stick to it. Now, what is a distance? <coughs> A distance is simply taking these numbers and representing them, representing them in a coordinate space. So let's plot 
the data in this way. This is species A. Species A is a parameter that says, OK, I have a sample. How is this sample characterized in terms of species A? Okay. How does it measure in terms of species A? Suppose that the species A is a, is a characteristic of the sample. I have one sample which is species A-ish. I have a sample which is not species A-ish. It doesn't have any species A, all right? So this is the numbers of species A, and this is the number of species B. So what is this blue dot here? What is this blue dot? What is this blue dot? Tell me. This blue dot is sample B, exactly. Exactly, Jan, that's sample B. Sample B is a dot that has 70 measurements of species A and has 10 measurements of species B. That's it, it's coordinates, all right? And we also have sample A up here, which has 35 individuals of species A and 40 individuals of species B. That's it, quite simple. Now, what is distance? Distance is essentially the geometrical distance between those two points. That's what we call Euclidean distance. And it's very, very easy to calculate. Because as you see, this is a triangle. We would need to calculate the length of this hypotenuse. So if we take the number of species A in sample B and the number of species A in sample A, then we have one of the sides of the triangle, we have the other side of the triangle, and then therefore the calculation is absolutely straightforward. For this case, hmm, this is what we call, as I just told you, a clear distance. Now, Let's suppose we have a third species, species C. That's a problem. Then we need a third axis. But still, those points will be in space, separated by a given distance in space. The third axis will be species C. That's it. So we can calculate the Euclidean distance in exactly the same manner, because that distance doesn't depend on the number of dimensions. And the number of dimensions of this space is essentially the number of species you have. You have 10 species, you have 10 dimensions. You have 20 species, you have 20 dimensions. There will always be a distance between point A, which will, will be one single dot in this 20-dimensional space, and point B, which will be one single dot in this 20-dimensional space. And there will be a straight line, a straight line in 20-dimensional space. Naturally, we just something we, we can't see unless we project it. And the calculation of this line will be the Euclidean distance, which is this. That's simple straight, forward, etc. It has a lot of problems, so it's never used. Because uh, it tends to get to infinity, it, to, it tends to grow continuously, and uh, it's rather difficult to use unless you standardize it somehow. Hmm? Essentially, more species, more dimensions, dimensions, and ecological distance is essentially the average of all those distances. Those are Widely, widely used uh, quantitative distances, or, well, I'm going to correct myself, myself. Those are distances that should be used because they have desirable properties. Not necessarily they have been the most used formulations along history. The Sorensen index, for instance, for abundance, not to be confused with the Sorensen index in the binary space, and probably the Morisita index, which is extremely robust. Hmm? Basically, as you see, they are variations of Euclidean distance in standardizations of Euclidean distances. There are more indexes. Hmm? There are indexes like uh, the Euclidean distance, we saw it. Normally, we take the average, as I, saw, I said before. The bray curtis index has been used widely, and it basically is the basis of the GDM, which is standardizing the Euclidean distance over space, or the Canberra matrix, which is standardizing the, the Euclidean distance over spaces. Hmm? This is also called the, uh, uh, well, whatever. The Manhattan is the basis of, of all of them, <coughs> Manhattan distance. And some distance, uh, distances are calculated non-metrically, such as Rinconen, which is basically the minimum, the minimum, the sum of minimum distances that you can get across your data set. Or this index, which is 
based on information theory, so basically it's an elaboration of Shannon's index in multidimensional space, which is called the Horn index. Probably one of the best index ever, although it's not as robust as Morisita, but it has some advantages over Morisitas. Well, the main advantage is that the Morisita index cannot be used with continuous data. It has to be used with individuals, whereas the Horn index can be used over continuous data, such as proportions or biomasses, abundances, etc. A number of caveats, caveat emptors, as Tom said before. They are often driven by the more abundant species, and rare species will tell you little. That's a common problem in the Barry Curtis index. Some indices cannot be defined when two samples lack any shared species, or cannot properly handle absences because they give undefinite results. It's basically a divide by zero and then you're, you're lost. Metric indexes are strongly affected by sample size. The bigger the sample size, the bigger the distances. And some indices, indexes cannot work with continuous data, as I show you in the case of Morisita. So it's extremely important. If you are working with this, first look at noise, then consult the literature. There is abundant literature on this, and you you'd better advise not to make that decision alone. Look at what people have people has to say, and especially look at what failures are available in literature by using the wrong index. Although it's very difficult that somebody has, who has failed using an index will publish it. 